game because you know we can't really do that in real life and i generally do not like therapy in a sitting down tell me how you feel like i've never found a therapist that works for me so for me it's like an elf um and i can't imagine if i had not started seeking a different outlet what i would have done otherwise you feeling like getting into fights as an adult would probably be a thing uh getting in trouble more definitely be a thing you know like i've i've definitely gotten my share of trouble and i learned lessons to not ever have problems with my anger as a result it's a lifelong debilitating issue you know like it's it's bad oh my god that is so unhealthy Is this an active friend that you hang out with, like, on the regular? You should definitely suggest he, I don't know, maybe hop in stream and know that he's not alone. Or at least tell him some of the things I've shared with you so that he can know that he's not alone. Because I know that a lot of the things I dealt with, I had nobody growing up. I was like... the. I was like a basic loner kid growing up. I like didn't talk to people, didn't really like go to sports, didn't really he's my best friend, I helped him cope and I suggested therapy. Therapy's kinda hit or miss for people like us, you know. If he's like me, he probably spends a lot of time in his head. And so he probably doesn't think therapy will help him at all. It helps to talk to people who have experienced it, honestly. A therapist can only get you so far because I gotta make sure my girl's not listening to me or she'll come in here freaking out because she she got her degree in psychology and unfortunately one of the biggest problems me and my girl have in our relationship and, and I, I'm gonna keep it real with you guys I still have you know my little anger issues and when it's good when I'm good we're great you know we're fantastic but if I'm having like one of my swings and I'm not really being down with my reasoning a small nothing comment can turn into me like literally freaking out and just kind of talking in a circle and trying to like place blame you know um and i've noticed that like it's a literally a direct result of my upbringing and like it's i'm gonna keep having the same issue until i like talk about it because putting it out in the world kind of helps you put it into perspective you know like i started doing so i was talking about uh drug usage i started doing psychedelics um probably Five years now, I started doing psychedelics. I think. Um, fuck, you know the story of my cat, right, Vixen? Like, you know that whole story with Nova. I feel like I've told you. No. Oh wow, that's a story. I never told you the story how my best friend died, came back as my cat. You sure. Alright, let me go grab a snack for my mouth real quick and then I'll get into it. What am I looking for? Check what's engraved on monument. There we go. Morai, the capital of Enkavia, achieved harmony and prosperity under the might. I'm gonna back. She made buffalo chicken dip and this shit's phenomenal.
I don't wanna hurt you. No, 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 no. Oh man. The story I'm about to tell you, Vixen, is your friend available? Because I feel like he would benefit from this story quite a bit. It's completely irrelevant to the trauma. Um, well, actually, maybe not irrelevant to the trauma, but there's lessons to be learned from it. I try to, especially people who, who I think can benefit from hearing such a story, shoot them a link and just tell them to like sit and listen for their five, ten minutes or something. Somebody wants to, you know, obviously don't like force them to, but. Alright, bum 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 bum. Oh, wait. Um. It's supposed to be like right here. Oh. Mm -hmm. Alright. <laughs> it's I forgot it's football. Alright, um. Yeesh, where do I even begin? So, I mean, you've heard all the dramatic stuff that I've kind of dealt with for the most part. That's obviously the tip of the iceberg, but that's more or less, you know, some of the things I've had to deal with. Growing up in that situation kind of left me uh, severely impacted as an adult trying to function in the real world. And so, you know, always had some issues with just people, relationships. Relationships is a big one, both rela uh, romantically and just in general. Relationships have always been hard for me to maintain because generally I haven't really seen much of a healthy relationship. <clears throat> So, pretty much loner, didn't really have a lot of friends. I, I was, that's not a bad thing. Like I preferred it that way because I, I know I'm kind of a weirdo. I, I prefer the word eccentric since I've learned it. You, you guys can all relate, you know me enough. So obviously me growing up and being me was kind of hard to have friends. And so I didn't really experience that until like adulthood where I started having like actual like friends. And I don't even remember how it happened. I believe we were at a, a show I was like a, at a show with a friend and that friend brought this friend and this kid's name was Nova and he was like this really awesome, like, like really enlightened spirit, like super, super spiritual man, loved to dance. He was all about positivity, all about love. Talk, I've never, it was so weird. I've never seen someone just so openly charismatic about life. It was just natural. <laughs> He walked the, around talking to strangers as if he knew them. Like, everyone was a personable level. Everyone knew this kid. And it was obvious like when, I, when we met that like there was something between us, like a chemistry, you know, like it was just un unmatched. I've never experienced that with somebody before. And so we like, we got along really quickly. It was almost like, you know, when you meet someone like a girl, well, you may not know this, but you know, like hot and heavy, you like meet someone, you guys click really well. Next thing you know, you're like fucking and moving in together like in the first six months kind of thing like that kind of hot and heavy it's kind of like that with our friendship we like met vibed really well got along super like super great i had this like an immense bond form almost immediately between me jimmy and nova the trifecta and so we pretty much started spending all the time together you know like me being an adult i had my own place um and even though they were kind of like all within my age group um no one had their own place so i became like you know the sanctuary we all would just come over to my crib kick it I was like a full-fledged working adult and had all my friends, you know? So we did this for, I don't know, like a year, just casually like becoming really close friends and going to festivals, going to like shows, like learning how to shuffle, learning how to be just a generally better person, you know? Kind of just came along with hanging out with them. You don't want to be the dick in front of your friends, you know? And after a while, of, I wouldn't call it pretending, but after a while of not doing what's normal to you because it's weird or like not expected and then doing the trend of the people around you just kind of becomes a natural thing. And I noticed that like, I stopped being so aggressive and like kind of took a chill pill and my friends kind of helped me stay in place. Well, after about like a year of this, Nova one day was like, you know, have you ever thought about doing acid? LSD. And I was like, at this point I had heard of it, but I'd never really cared. You know, like I wasn't spiritual, wasn't really like huge into drugs. I smoked pot, but like, I've maybe done Molly at this point and I was like, yeah, you know, whatever. I just knew that acid was like a, like a 16 hour ride. It's like a ride you get on, you, you put the seatbelt on and then you weld it shut because there's no way you're getting out of it. You're, you're in it for 16 hours. And historically I've heard some pretty interesting things about, you know, experiences and just wasn't never interested in doing it on my own. Granted, little did I know I had actually had experiences with psychedelics 
in a non-spiritual capacity years prior when I did like a, a designer drug is what it's called. And it was a designer drug for LSD. And it gave me intense visuals. Like I would be staring at the floor and it would just, I would see sp like fucking spirals and geometric pa patterns. It was crazy, but it wasn't a spiritual kind of thing. It was just like, woo, pretty colors. So fast, you know, backtracking. So, you know, he talked to me about it and was like, you know, you, I don't want to pressure you into it, but like, you know, if you want to try it for the first time, you know, we'll be here to take care of you. We can go, go through things, you know, just kind of like, you know, see how you feel. And you're with the homies, you're like, caution to the wind, give me the drugs, you know, like, fuck yeah, let's do it. Bro, I don't think I've ever laughed. I, I've never laughed more in my life than the first few weeks of me doing acid and just hanging out with my homies in my house. The the vibe was just unreal. We were like, we were like children. We basically reverted into child form. And Nova was our like our our spirit guide, and he would just lead us through the conversations like fucking knife and hot butter. You know, it was just it was so smooth and perfect. And like, we I, we must have spent days. I can't even say hours. Days talking about every experience that I could remember in my life, like as it came up. Cause when you're on acid, your memories are just kind of like all over the place. You can't really, whatever's kind of like in your subconscious bothering you is the first thing that comes to light. There's really no way around it. Especially if it's something that like, you know, deep down you have to deal with and you just kind of like put it into a box and left it alone. You do acid, that, that door is not even like unlocked. That fucking, oh, like an explosion happens in that chest and it gets just thrown everywhere. You know, so it's really not recommending you to do a drug like that if you have any kind of psychological disposition because it can literally make you go crazy. Like people can have a psychotic break and lose their shit. Keep that in, yeah, keep that in mind if you ever have the situation or pause. So we spent time like kind of just going through my baggage, essentially. It didn't really feel like therapy. Like I look back at it now, 100% it was therapy. Like sitting there with the homies, shooting the shit, talking about how fucked my life was and just hearing them reassure me that, you know, that was fucked, reassure that it's, you know, it wasn't my fault. Like all the things that you would want to hear from someone that you care about were what I was experiencing in these moments. And being on a drug like acid, a psychedelic in general, kind of lets you re-experience the emotion without actually being emotional. So you can kind of re-experience the entire thing as if you're in the room, but instead of you being in the room in your seat, you're in the room behind your seat watching. And it, it paints a whole new perspective on your memories when you can do that. And so I started to notice that after like a couple of weeks, months of doing this like repetitive, like every weekend we'd like do a bunch of acid and just bullshit at my house. We were throwing parties and like having like acid parties. People would come over. We would like all the stars and stuff in my room. That actually started as a project between me and Nova, one of my old places. We, we threw an acid party or a constellation party and we, we all dropped acid and just picked up a spot on the wall and put up stars. Like that's how that came to fruition. This whole idea of the trip safe space evolved from him and I hanging out together. And we spent like hours on the first iteration of this room with him on my shoulders and me walking around the room with him on my shoulders and him just putting stars up and like this on the ceiling hours on hours. It was, it was great. And that like that itself was therapy. We sit there like trippy balls, putting up stars and just talking. So we fast forward, let's say about a year, um, you know, and out of the blue, this is like November, 2016, out of the blue, this motherfucker and I are tripping and we're hanging out at my house. And like, you know, he's always been like a spiritual kind of person, like, you know, with our thoughts to make the world. He always had this like weird aura about it. And like, I was not spiritual. I was agnostic. Uh, you know, I needed to hold it to believe it. I grew up Catholic and, and religious. I fucking got rid of all that as soon as I turned like 11. Like I realized it was all a crack of shit. So him being spiritual never really bothered me, but I always thought it was like haka poo poo, you know, like haka poo poo. I don't know what that is. Whatever. It's nothing. He used to, he never like mocked me for, he just said, you'll know Papa when you're ready to know, it'll just come to you. And that's, he would just leave it like that. This is where she gets weird. I get goosebumps every time I recount the story. So for no reason whatsoever, we're hanging out and we're like, you know, we start tripping and he just looks at me and he goes, yo, what would you do if you died tomorrow? Like completely taking it back. I just looked at him and was like, I have to come back and haunt you. Like there would be no way. What do you mean if I just died tomorrow? What kind of question is that? He starts laughing and he's just like, I think I'll come back as your pet. I was like, my pet? And he was like, why? He's just like, I've seen the way you are with animals. I, I love animals. I, I, you may not 
see me do it much, but I'm always like, little baby kitty boy. Like, I'm with that with every critter. I've saved geese, I've saved cats, dogs, squirrels, you name it. Chances are I've interacted with it in some way. Like, I have a, I have a whole story where I saved a goose. His name is Howard. He got run over. I saved him in the side of the road, took him home, cared for him two weeks, and then brought him to a sanctuary. Like, that's the kind of person I am. I love animals. They can't, they can't advocate for themselves, you feel me? So, he was like, I'll come back as your pet. All right, cool. Let's, well, I can't really have dogs here. He was like, I'll come back as your dog. You know, my sister has a dog. And I was like, oh, I can't really have dogs in my apartment. He was like, oh, well, then, like, I'll come back as your cat. And I was like, oof. I don't know about that, man. I've never really had a cat before. And he was like, oh, come on, Bob, you can have a cat. Cats are great. And I was just like, yeah, I don't know, man. Cats can be kind of funny to have. And he was just like, oh, come on, what kind of cat would you want? And I'm like, look, man, if I was going to have a cat, it'd have to be a very particular kind of cat. And he was like, okay, what kind of cat? And I was just like, all right, well, I've always liked Garfield, so I would really love, you know, a Garfield cat. Outside No Man Camp Channel 1. Oh. So I was like, I would really love a Garfield like cat. Panel is full. No. I can't go to either one of these because they're full. Oh, it, it gets better. So, what kind of cat do you want? Orange tabby cat. You know, fiddling on the details. I'm like, it'd have to be like Garfield. It'd be super smart, independent. I want it to be really cute and cuddly, but at the same time, like, I don't want it to be up my ass all the time. And he starts laughing. He's like, you're asking for like a really specific cat. And I'm like, bro, I told you if I'm going to have a cat, it needs to be a specific kind of cat. Otherwise, I don't want it. And he's like, all right, I got you, boy. If I die, I'll come back as your cat. And we left it at that. I still get goosebumps just thinking about like those words were said. Like th that's literally what he said to me. This next part gets weird. So that was November of 2017, 2016. 2016. That was November of 2016, and you fast forward to like January. Him and I are kind of beefing. I owe him some money for some drugs that he gave me, and he gave me like a, a bunch of drugs ahead of time because I was supposed to be getting a check back from school, and I was gonna give him money. And it was like all this nonsense that you would expect friends to not be beefing over. But because he was in a spot, and I was kind of fucking with that spot, he was just kind of beefing me. So we we're like, you know. So my birthday plans, I was supposed to pick him up and pick this girl up and we were supposed to go to my party. I was having a party. I got one of those, uh, I got one of these like 10 person club things. I got in New York city, I had a club to myself and they were like, give me well shots for like $5 a person because it was my birthday. And like, I, I could bring up the 10 people. It was like this whole big thing. So the idea was bring her, this girl, him, to my party. We're going to like get our shit, you know, party on. And we're going to like have a threesome when we got home. Well, she was actually kind of feeling him more than me, but her and I were like friendly. So like I had a feeling like if he initiated it and he was the leading, you know, chances are we're gonna have a threesome. So like, I was looking forward to that. She was kind of cute. And it was my birthday, you know, it was my birthday. Who's the one to threesome for the birthday? So because we're beefing, that didn't happen. Um, he ended up hanging out with her separately. They did their own thing. And then he asked someone else to drive them home. Originally, I was supposed to pick her up, drive her to the party, party with them, drive her home to Pennsylvania. Because of the whole, you know, he had someone else do it. So here I am. It's like February 3rd, my birthday. I'm at the club. We're vibing. I get a text message. I get a phone call from him, and I ignored it. And um, it, was, uh, it was like it was at like midnight, you know, that I ignored it and just kept it pushing because I didn't want to deal with it. He texted me after I ignored it, and he was like, any word on my money? And I was just like, really, guy? It's my birthday. Like. So I ignored it. Um, next morning, wake up, start getting phone calls from all of our mutual friends. They can't find Mackenzie. Yeah, I think her name was Mackenzie. They can't find Mackenzie. No one knows where she is. I get another phone call back. Mackenzie was killed in a car crash. No one can find Nova. Well, like, you know, I already knew. My gut, like, I knew. I start freaking the fuck out. Start trying to figure out where he is and calling everybody and trying to track down his whereabouts. And like, I get a phone call from one of our mutual friends letting me know that my gut intuition was right. He, he had asked somebody else to drive her home and that person was racing some other car like 140 miles an hour in like a 
30 mile an hour zone and lost control of the car, flipped over the divider, rolled a bunch of times, killed both Nova and Mackenzie, and the driver survived with two broken arms and no memory of what happened. I still can't, you know, like, I, I don't understand, I don't understand how to... So, uh, my life pretty much ended. Um, I started failing school. I really stopped caring, you know? Um, it was bad. The The amount of guilt I felt was just unreal. And, like, I, obviously I felt personally responsible because a, a small, you know, like they say, like a butterfly effect, you know, like one small uh, flap in the, a different direction could have changed the whole outcome of history. You know, I never really felt that. You know, like I've understood the concept, but, like, that was I, like that was it. I know in another timeline I made a different decision and this didn't happen, but at the same time, in that other timeline, he might not have told me the story that he did to kind of set me up for what happens next, you know? Um, so, yeah, the next two weeks were, like, hell. I wasn't eating. I was not sleeping. I was contemplating killing myself. Um, it was bad. And then I went to the funeral, and um, I met his mom for the first time, which was really an incredible experience because I had, like, I knew her as another mom, basically. Like, she knew who I was by name, and because she was always at my house. So, like, she, he called me her, his brother to her. And like he had another brother, another little brother, and so I was like his brother from another mother, and we had never met before, and I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to ask for any ashes or anything like that. And I might have mentioned to like one of our, I mentioned to Jimmy, our mutual friend, that like I wanted some ashes to make my necklace. That's that's what this necklace is. His ashes are in here, and I sealed it. And um, I wasn't really sure what you know what would happen because I've never actually met his mom, and for me to ask for ashes from her son, you know, and I'm a nobody, I was really expecting to get nothing from that, and. I, the opposite happened actually. We went to the funeral, we met for the first time, and it was just like this incredible sense of knowing her. And she knew who I was, and she was just like, you know, we, we bonded together over our grief. And she was like, you know, I may not have never met you, but I always considered you my son. My, my son always thought of you as family, and he always talked about you, and you're always, you know, with him. And, you know, I can't imagine what you're going through right now. And, you know, and I looked at her and was just like, I didn't even, I don't even think I told her the story because I, you know, I, I don't think I'd be able to like live with myself if I did, honestly. I don't know if she would blame me or not, but I know that after I told this story to at least one of our mutual friends, they all, at least one of them said, well, why didn't you just, why did you do that? You know, like, so the funeral was something else. I've never seen so many people show up to some guy's funeral. We were like in SMAP like middle of like Bro Brooklyn I want to say and people from all over the US came people were from New York from like neighboring states from across the country all people that know the whose heart he's touched essentially there was like 50 people and god the group of degenerates at this funeral man I'm talking like you got ranging people in suits and looking like they're there to grief and then you have people who were like bawling their eyes out but looked like they straight up just walked off the street corner you know like that was the mix of people at this funeral and how diverse his friend group was and like everyone was welcome it was people from all walks of life essentially and you know I, at the funeral his mom gave me an envelope full of his ashes and was like you know i i know that you asked for this and i know that he would want you to have them you were family just as much you know as, as he was and it was a little bit comfort to know that at least that, you know, I had that, but it wasn't enough, and I was at home, and I was just not, I was just not doing well, and I failed one of my classes at school, and I was thinking about dropping out, and then shit gets really weird, I get a phone call, it's just random, fucking, like, two weeks after his funeral, it's like almost the end of the month, and my sister calls me up, and she's like, yo, bro, where are you right now? And I'm like, I'm home, why? She's like, can you come over here, please? Why? She's like, bro, there's this cat. I don't even know what this, how to say. This cat's been sitting outside my house for a couple of days now. 
and it's just sitting here meowing, bro, and it is driving Rex fucking crazy. I'm so sick of this pit bull barking. I've tried feeding it. I tried giving it water. I thought maybe it would leave. It didn't. It's just sitting here. I'm, I'm at my wit's saying, Can you please come do something? Sure. You know, like, I thought nothing of it. Um, it's interesting. A little bit of backstory I'm going to share with you makes the next part of this kind of even more creepy. So Nova and my sister, they were fuck buddies. After Nova and I became intimate and, like, we hanging out, or became, I guess, intimate in the sense of, like, you know, friendship, and, um, I introduced them to my sister. They kind of like, you know, liked each other. But like, Nova was like a drug dealer and a, a festival attender. You know, he wasn't like uh, works nine to five, has career ambitions beyond. You know what I'm saying, day to day. So, and my sister was really is really hood and ghetto, but also like has a stable job, has a career path, has um, standards that she will, you know what I'm saying, to date. But she'll fuck. So I was hopeful that one day he would like. Marry into the family. That was my genuine hope. Is that he would marry into the family. Well, at the very least, get her knocked up, and then he'd be stuck with me. You know, um, that's important. Because I'm pretty sure he knew what he was doing. He lived on the first floor, ground level. I live on the third floor. So I'm like, okay, I'll be right over. I go out, come out of our house. Hey, what's up, sis? You know, where's this cat? He's like, bro, this cat's weird. It's in the bathroom. I'm like, why is, what's weird about it being in the bathroom? She's like, I just gave it a bath. I was like, what? She's like, yeah, bro, it was meowing at the house, at the, door, at the doorstep. So I like opened the door and it just walked right in the house. Like it fucking just walked right in. And I'm like, what about Rex? And she's like, it didn't care. Rex is in the cage now. And you can like, you can hear the, the dogs in the background. background. <gasps> she had like this really massive pit bull. And he recently just died of cancer. But up until the day he died, that dog was just a fucking pure ball of uninhibited energy. He was just a dog through and through, you know? cutest little fucking spark plug of energy you've ever seen but definitely was one of those dogs that like small cr like creatures oh fun 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 you know like he was that kind of dog so small little orange cat primo fun toy you know so he, she, she's like god the cat just walking in the house like he owns the place and like you see the dog in the background barking i'm like where's the cat she's like it's in the bathroom i gave it a bath and i'm like you gave this cat a bath and she's like bro this cat's weird i, I kid you not it's just been chilling like it, it looks like it might have lived here before i don't know it's so friendly though, so I was like, fuck it. I'm like, all right, let me see this cat. So she went open the door to the bathroom and out strolls this fucking six month old orange tabby cat. And it just put, it took two steps out of the bathroom and we made eye contact and it meowed and I fucking lost it. I, I lost it. I cannot even, I, I wish I could explain to you, like, is my heart rate going up just thinking about this right now? It should, it is, yeah. There are no words to describe how fucking bad I lost it. I made eye contact with the cat and I was just like immediately, are you fucking kidding me? Because you know, Nova believed with our thoughts to make the world and magic's real, you just have to believe in it. All this crazy shit he believed in, I just like, you know, I ignored and like, Opens the door, out strolls orange tabby cat. We lock eyes, he meows and sits, and I just knew. I immediately knew. This motherfucker came back as my cat. He actually did it. He he's right there. I lost it. I start bawling. I hit the ground and start crying. I'm like rolling back and forth. I cannot contain it. My sister's freaking the fuck out at this point. She's like, what's wrong? So I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to explain to her the whole thing. Like I told her, about the story with me and Nova and like how I felt responsible for his death. And she also kind of shot me that look of like, damn bro, you could have changed that, you know? And so like, 
she I knew she would understand. So I told the whole story. Her jaw hit the floor. I don't think I've ever seen my sister so taken back at something, you know, like jaw hit the floor and completely gassed. And I'm just like, like I, I can't even I can't even explain the the mixture of emotions. I'm like happy and sad and, and in disbelief and in amazement all at the same time. And this fucking cat. It just, it just knew. It knew that I knew. Like, I went over to it. I picked it up. And the fucking cat just looked at me in my fucking eye. It, like, looked at me with its piercing eyes right into my soul. And was like, I'm back, motherfucker. And then it put its paw on my necklace. And just, no. And that was it. Life went right back to normal. It was as if you never left. Went back to school. Got my grade wiped away for the F I, I had. Got straight A's after that cat became part of my life it, it was literally as if his energy just came right back i went from wanting to kill myself to wanting to conquer life essentially wanting to completely come back and well if he just proved to me that you can come back as an animal then there's everything because i've always had these weird beliefs of how uh, our reality works and i've always just kind of had an idea that you know like there's like a a, a theory that like we live in a simulation Close. Real close. Not necessarily a simulation, but reality is as real as you make it to be. And I mean that as exactly as plain as it sounds. We are living, we are one, I don't know how to explain this without sounding completely crazy, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and say it. And everyone has their own beliefs. I shit on no one's belief systems at all, but I know from my own experiences that this is more or less as close to fact as I think we can get at least in my mind. Whether people will agree with that sentiment or not, I could care less. This is my, my foundation. Pretty sure we were all one big ball of energy, unconscious energy, and we existed. And at some point, we decided that we wanted to know what life was like in a physical self. And so, big ball of energy decided to say, okay, well, let's, let's explore that idea, and I will give up this form so that you can experience life in a different form. Think of that as God. The singular idea that I want to experience myself in a different form. That thought was God. And so, boom, we have the Big Bang, the universe is created, and now an unconscious pool of energy. Think of like the ether. You ever think of like the void, like the just big empty white space? Think of that as the in-between between what reality was and wasn't, because we, were either, we either were or weren't, you know, on or off kind of thing. So that white space is where we, where we all had come from originally, and then it was, we popped into existence so that we could all know each other but it's not as cut and dry as i'm just gonna be born with the knowledge right because that there's no growth there so you have people and this has been historically like throughout history you know jesus is you know one of them that most people already know off the top of their head is a person who flat out said like i'm god's son you're god's son we're all the children of god nothing that i do is significant to me all of you can do it you know what i'm saying like those are the teachings he he said about when he was like when he was preaching it's because it's exactly that. I'm pretty sure we're like the same person experiencing life in a different perspective indefinitely. Meaning every single person you see is a re of yourself looking back at you in a different timeline. So they say like, do unto others as you would want done to yourself. That saying is a saying to live by because it literally is that. When you look at someone, you may not see yourself. That's you. Inherently, we're all built from the same, same, same. You know, the difference is that each one of us gets a conscious mind attached to our unconscious souls that kind of shapes who we are in this lifetime. Right. I don't know if you're familiar with Sigmund Freud and kind of his idea on the self. It's kind of a little bit of that. The ego that we experience, my ego, your ego, what makes you inherently you, your ego. That's an accumulation of what you've built in this lifetime. It's your foundational structure. It's you here now. But if you think deeper than that, think about the things that intrinsic, intrinsically feel a certain way, right? If they talk about nurture versus nature, you know, some people are just rotten to their core and it doesn't matter how they're raised. Then you have other people who were rotten to, the, to them. Like there was people who were rotten to the core, like your friend's parents, raising other people. And those people know that's wrong. Even though they're being taught from their, you know, 
parent, whomever, nature versus nurture, they know in their soul that's wrong. And so they live their life differently. That is the accumulation of all your past life selves underneath the surface of your new life self telling you, listen to me, this is actually, you know, like it's, you're thinking surface level right now. This is, this is the true you on the inside. You have that clash obviously with your current personality and you know, the, the ways that we all born thinking things are supposed to work, they clash at times. And that's when you have that dialogue. Some people don't have this dialogue with themselves and it worries me. Most people I think hear themselves when they talk, right? Like if you talk out loud, you hear yourself in your head. Like at any point, in, at any point in time, I always have a voice running in my head, an inner monologue. It's constant, and I can never shut it the fuck up. That's why I struggle with ADHD and and meditation. There are some people who don't have that problem, and those people are like real surface level because they don't think deeply at all. I think that when you think deeply, you always have this inner voice that's kind of like, and that's the voice that you know is part of us all. That's why some people just, most people just know certain things are wrong. Certain things are right. No, you shouldn't do that. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the intrinsic value that we all share behind the curtain. Now I think that reality is we're all trying to evolve from that. You know, like everything has been repeating. The world has been living in a cycle and it's just repeating itself, repeating itself, repeating. What's next? You know, I firmly believe that we are trying to grow to a different form. And by that I mean if you think about how the, the science that we have right now about like um how evolution started, you know, were, were people monkeys, were they apes, all that kind of stuff. Think of that, but on a bigger kind of scale of, if we're humans now, can we evolve into something more with another million years of, of consciously trying to evolve into something different, right? Because think about it, animals, nature in general, if there's been a gap in need, we've adapted to it biologically, right? We live in the dark, our society lives in the dark all the time. We start growing more familiarity with being in the dark. You get more accustomed to seeing in the night. You know what I'm saying? That's it's just kind of intrinsic with, with where you're at, your, your nature around you. And I think that's how evolution works is when you biologically crave a need for something to change, somewhere down the line, the universe provides that change because enough people have requested it. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like, think of it like we live in a big pool of shared thought that's a good way to put it we live in a big pool of shared thought and that shared thought gives physical form to reality that we experience and if enough people start realizing that what i'm saying is factual then we will literally be living the world we want to live in and by that i mean like let's say for example i say this while it may look like cider is actually a can of apple juice and like as i put it down i firmly believe that so much that as i set it down it actually literally becomes apple juice in front of you like it physically changes i honestly believe that if enough people believe that was factual that at some point in reality it actually would be and i know that sounds absolutely fucking far-fetched but i've already experienced things that break the boundaries of reality for me so i no longer have a doubt in my mind like i'm i'm pretty sure that's 100% what's gonna happen. It may not be in my lifetime, but I know that because of the soul that I've been working with this lifetime and what I'm trying to achieve going towards my next one, I may not experience it in this lifetime, but my energy will 100% be a part of that change going forward. I've made it my mission in this entire fucking existence. I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're changing things. Like I'm no, this is fucking unreal. And I, I, I like, I tend to think that I'm kind of a new soul. You know, my girlfriend says she's an old soul and it shows. I, I think I'm a new soul. I think maybe I was like a like an animal in a previous life. You know, I, I might have just upgraded up the totem pole from animal to human. You know, like think of the, the karmic cycle, the way you um, you transition in, in reincarnated forms, depending on like how well you did in the last one. Pretty sure I must have just like, I must have been a really good dog in my last life and they gave me an opportunity to be human. I'm, I'm crushing it. Well, I like to say I'm crushing it, but I'm doing pretty good. You know? So the idea is that hopefully one day I'll die and I'll have this reaffirmed to me and I'll get to come back and do this shit again. And if that happens, you'll know. 100%. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I haven't really nailed down a like a firm belief on how exactly it works, but I'll give you an example of what, I, what I'm talking about. So I don't know if you've ever heard this story before. It's called The Egg by Andy Ware.
I'm going to read you the story. I don't remember when I found it. And I don't know how exactly it came across me. But since reading this story and sharing it with other people, it's actually been really surprising to see how many other people have heard of this story and kind of just of its existence, but like put it in the back of their mind kind of thing. It's called The Egg. You were on your way home when you died. It was a car accident. Nothing particularly remarkable, but fatal nonetheless. You left behind a wife and two children. It was a painless death. The EMTs tried their best to save you, but to no avail. Your body was so utterly shattered, you were better off, trust me. And, when that, and that's when you met me. What? What happened, you asked? Where am I? You died, I said matter-of-factly. No point in mincing words. There was a, a truck, and it was skidding. Yep, I said. Wait a minute, I, I died? Yep, but don't feel bad about it. Everyone dies, I said. You looked around. There was nothingness. Just you and me. What is this place, you asked? Is this the afterlife? Eh, more or less, I said. Wait, are you God, you asked? Yep, I'm God. My kids, my wife, what about them? Will they be all right? Well, that's what I like to see, I said. You just died and your main concern is for your family? That's some good stuff right there. You looked at me with fascination. To you, I didn't look like God. I just looked like some man, or possibly a woman. Some vague authority figure, maybe. More of a grammar school teacher than the Almighty. Don't worry, I said. You'll be, they'll be fine. Your kids will remember you as, a perfect, as perfect in every way, but they didn't have, they didn't have time to grow up to contempt for you. Your wife will cry on the inside, but will be secretly relieved. To be fair, your marriage was falling apart. If it's any consolation, she'll be very guilty for feeling relieved. Honestly, this this part of the story, like having read it and, and reflecting it to my own life, I want to say, and this could just be, I call it, I call it hobby science, broom science, right? This could just be broom science. If my life had gone on the trajectory that it was with the rage and aggression and abuse and the perpetuating cycle, this would be me. After my first relationship and having a kid, this would have been me. Let me go back to where I was. Your wife will cry on the outside. Your wife will cry on the inside, but be secretly relieved. To be fair, your marriage is falling apart. If it's any consolation, she'll be, be feel very guilty for feeling relieved. Oh, you said. So what happens now? Do I go to heaven or hell or something? Neither. You'll be reincarnated. Ah, you said. So the Hindus were right. All the religions were right in their own way. Walk with me. You follow along as we. Sp as we strode through the void. Where are we going? Nowhere in particular, I said. It's just nice to walk and talk. So what's the point then, you said. When I get reborn, I'll just be a blank slate, right? A baby? All my experiences and everything I did in this life won't matter? Not so, I said. You have within you all the knowledge and experience of all your past lives. You just don't remember them right now. I stopped walking and took you by the shoulders. Your soul is more magnificent, beautiful, and gigantic than you could ever possibly imagine. A human mind can only contain a tiny fraction of what you are. It's like sticking your finger in a glass of water to see if it's hot or cold. You put a tiny part of yourself into the vessel, and when you bring it back out, you've gained all the experiences it's had. You've been a human for the last 48 years, so you haven't stretched out yet and felt the rest of your immense consciousness. If we all hung out here long enough, you'd start to remember everything, but there's no point in that between each life. How many times have I been reincarnated then? You asked. Oh, lots and lots. And in lots of different lives. This time around, you'll be a Chinese peasant girl in 540 AD. Wait, what? You stammered. You're sending me back in time? Uh, well, I guess technically. You know, time as you know it only exists in your universe. Things are a lot different from where I come from. Where you come from, you said. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, sure. I come from somewhere, somewhere else. And there are others like me. I will know you want to know what it's like, but honestly, you wouldn't understand. Oh, you said a little let down. But wait, if I get reincarnated to other places in time, I could have interacted with myself at some point? Sure, it happens all the time. And with both lives only aware of their own lifespan, you don't even know what's happening. So what's the point of it all? Seriously? You're asking me what the meaning of life is? Isn't that a little stereotypical? Well, I mean, I guess it's a reasonable question, you persisted. I looked at you in the eye. The meaning of life, the reason I made this whole universe, is for you to mature. You mean mankind? You want us to mature? No. Just you. I made this whole universe for you. Which each new life you grow and mature and become a larger and greater intellect. Just me? What about everyone else? There is no one else. I said, in this universe, there's just you and me. You stared at me blink you stared at blankly at me. But all the people on Earth. All you. All different incarnations of you. 
Wait, I'm everyone? Now you're getting it, I said, with a congratulatory slap on the back. I'm every human being that's ever lived. Or ever will be. I'm Abraham Lincoln. Yep, and you're John Will Boots, too. So I'm Hitler? And you're the millions he killed. I'm Jesus, and you're everyone he followed. You fell silent. Every time you victimize someone, I said, you are victimizing yourself. Every act of kindness you've done, you've done to yourself. Every happy and sad moment ever experienced by any human ever was and will be experienced by you. You thought for a long time. Why, you asked, why do all this? Because someday you will become like me, because that's what you are. You're one of my kind, you're my child. Whoa, you said incredulous, you mean I'm God? No, not yet, you're a fetus. You're still growing. Once you lived every human life throughout all of time, you have grown enough to be born. So the whole universe, you said, it's just an egg, I answered. And now it's time for you to be on your next life. And I sent you on your way. This is the story. Story to live by. So they've debunked the whole, we use only 10% of our mind thing. I think that's just a random number they pulled out. But yeah, I, I think of it exactly like that. I think that a human vessel can only contain... It's like you said, it's like taking your full finger and your whole arm and you're trying to gauge if the water's hot by just putting your small pinky in it. You know, like you can maybe get an idea, but like a small part of you is all you can put in. Imagine that. Imagine if you were, your body is only capable of holding so much energy and we're like this vast unlimited pool of energy. And so we just kind of put a little bit in each vessel because we don't want to like overdo it, you know, because who knows what that'll do. My guess actually would be telekinesis, matter movements, you know, telepathy, that would probably be what happens if we were to be born with just a little bit more than the average, is honestly. And we have a, we have cases proven of that being a thing. We just, we, we, we hide it. You know, we don't, we can't explain it, and so we don't talk about it. But I have read and researched and done countless, you know what, let's go pull one up. done countless researches into things that's some shit to believe in no offense yeah i that i don't take offense it's it's wild and it's funny too i have this whole theory that i've built and i've i've not like taken this from other people you know like i don't i try to i don't really study other religions not because i don't want to but because i don't want to pollute the belief system i'm building you know so i have no problem and it's funny because i'll like I'll tell people some of the thoughts I have, like what I just told you, and they'll be like, oh, that's already a thought in this religion. And I'll be like, that's great. I had no idea. You know? And it's even cooler to see that I've been able to put together this whole theory on how the universe works, and it, it touches on already pre-existing facets of our lives, and I have never once cut, cut past with those things. You know what I'm saying? So it just kind of goes to show that, like, if I can arrive to the same conclusion as millions of other people throughout time, it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck. You know, even if it doesn't look like a duck, you know what I'm saying? I don't live by beliefs either. I'm still kind of a piece of shit. I have this whole belief system and I still don't treat it as well as I should, but I still have it. <laughs> it's hard. Six people working, no one on calls. That's what I like to see, baby. But yeah, so that's that's my whole theory in a nutshell. And the whole thing with the cat, just the st I mean, the story is is over now essentially because he took off. He did some, he did some weird shit. I don't know. He disappeared. Um, I guess he was a really bored cat. Nova was like a very bored cat. He was. You can see him if you scroll down. You'll see a picture of him in my bio. That that's that was him. If you click on that picture, it brings you to his Facebook page, believe it or not. So, Nova's been missing for a year and two months. The way it happened is no short of annoying, but it happened nonetheless. I had him... I started teaching him to go outside, be like an indoor outdoor cat, like my current boy is, except I gave Nova a lot of leeway and just kind of like let him go and come back overnight. Next morning, he was always by the door waiting for food. He was a very food motivated cat. Never had an issue with him like leaving and not coming back. So, you know, he just kind of did that. He went out, 
for the night. We'd come back in the morning. It was great. He loved it. He was very bored as a house cat. He hated being inside all the day. All day. He just kind of lounged around and flat out told me he hated being a cat. Like it was great to come back and you know prove to me the world's different, you know. But he also really hated that he was a cat now. He was bored, and so I think that when I started to give him f the freedom to go outside and not freak out. Yeah, I do. I 100% think he is. He One day he went out and poof, vanished off the face of the earth. It's been, I had him for three years. He's with me every step of the way, always goes, comes back, never an issue. The one time he, when I first started teaching him to go outside, he like, he didn't run away, he hid. I freaked out bad. I was like running around the neighborhood, screaming his name, trying to find him. And it was a very apparent that I was not okay with like him not being there. The next time of him going and coming back, we were doing this for like a month or so. And the universe, the universe and I had a conversation. I don't know. I didn't know it at the time, but I'm pretty sure the universe gave me a heads up that he was going to leave. And I only connected the dots after he left. But thinking back on the whole thing, I could just be making, you know, drawing straws. My girlfriend says I'm always trying to like give a reason to things with after the fact thoughts, but it's, you know, I've, I stopped believing in coincidence a long time ago and it just seems like a really odd coincidence of events. I'm about to tell you what, what I mean. Um, so letting Nova go 